Well, many of you have, who have studied history will know that both within the church and outside of the church, in politics, in business institutions, in all spheres of life, every once in a while you bump into someone that we would call a charlatan, a fake, a fraud. There's a lot of fakers out there, people that are posers, people that pretend to be something they're not, or who cozy up with Christians or political establishments or even wealthy people because they have an agenda. And we would call them charlatans. Some of the more well-known charlatans who have also sought to deceive people would include historical figures like Rasputin, who lived from 1869 to 1916. He was a mystic, at least that's how he promoted himself, and he he made friends with the, the Russian royal family and became very close to them, one of their chief advisors. He wasn't an elected official. He wasn't from the royal family, but he, he spent all day every day in their homes and he would whisper like wormwood in their ear, various lies. He would claim that he had healing powers and he also, he, he ultimately was outed as a, as a master manipulator. So that's an example of someone from history outside of the church that was, manipulative, that was a charlatan. How about from within the church? Well, throughout Christian history, there have been many false teachers. One person that comes to mind is a TV preacher, a TV evangelist by the name of Peter Popoff. In the 1980s, Peter Popoff would go around and he would do all sorts of healing crusades. And the way he would set up his crusades is when you, you came in to the building, which he would rent, these large large uh, cavernous auditoriums and, and arenas, he would have you fill out a prayer card at the back. You'd put your name, put any ailments you're struggling with, and then you'd come and sit. And he would get up front and he would say things like, oh, you know, I, I sense that the Lord has just revealed to me there's a person named Nancy here today. And Nancy's struggling with um, gallstones. Is there a Nancy here that's struggling with gallstones? And Nancy would stand up amazed at this man's revelatory powers and come to the front. He would do his thing. Well, it turned out that he was wearing an earpiece and his wife would take the cards and she would whisper into his ears the names and ailments of the people. So he turned out to be a fake. He was exposed for that and, and many other frauds. Unfortunately, he's back in business today and people still sometimes watch false prophets like this online. But these, these false teachers are nothing new. They didn't just come on the scene in the 1800s. They're not new to the church in, in our generation. They've existed since the earliest days of the church. And there are two kinds of deceivers that often wage war against the Christian church. Those who would claim to be part of us, godly people, religious people, people that are part of maybe the visible church or community of faith, and those that would stand outside of the church, partnering with the church, but also part, ultimately partnering with the church for devious means. And in the, in the passage we're going to study, we're going to encounter the first of those. We're going to encounter a group of Jews that were sons of the high priest. They were part of believing Israel. They were, they were religious individuals. They were living in a, a pagan, uh, non-Christian environment. And, presenting themselves as, as men of God, but ultimately they're, they're, they're outed as charlatans. And the next week, we'll look at part two, where there are those that would associate with the church, benefit from their association with the church that also have an agenda that's contrary to the things of God. And so there's a bit of a warning here for us to beware of those that would seek to play God play the role of God or manipulate God. This is the subject of verses 11 through 20. And then next week, those that would overtly oppose the things of God because they have an agenda for the church or the people of God that doesn't square with God's agenda. So join me in, in Acts 19. Again, we're going to look at verse, verses 11 through 20. These verses serve as both a warning for false teachers but also encourage us to pursue bona fide faith in the Lord. And if you're going to pursue bona fide faith in the Lord, you want to avoid two, two errors. One is 
sitting in your hands on the sidelines in the back row because the last thing you want to do is present yourself as a man or woman of God. That's an error. To disbelieve that God's power can strengthen you and use you for mighty deeds, that's an error. To say, you know, God is not at work in the world today. I don't have the goods. I don't have the ability, so I'm just going to do nothing. That's an error. And it's also an error to assume that you can just grab hold of the power of God whenever you want and use it to draw attention for yourself or for your own purposes. So again, these are the, the, the messages that, that we'll encounter through Acts 19. And today the message is to beware of people who want to play the role of God. So here's my big idea. If you take notes before I actually read the scriptures for you, the big idea is this, that God empowers his people for his glory while judging those that use his power for their own gain. So on one hand, God does empower us for ministry so that we can bring glory to him. We need to believe that. We can be actually be strengthened by God to be useful to him in service. But God is not afraid of judging those that want to grab hold of his power for their own personal benefit. So number one, we affirm, breaking this down into bite-sized pieces, we affirm the power of God in godly people. We believe that God can fill us, empower us, use us as his servants to put his glory on display. Do you believe that? Well, if you don't, you're going to be confronted with that truth in the text. Before I read Acts verse 11, let me read to you three other passages of scripture to demonstrate that this is a theme woven through the word of God. God wants to empower godly people, his church, for ministry. I'll take you to Colossians chapter 1 for starters. Just going to read little snippets of these passages. Colossians chapter 1 verse 11 talks about the believer's capacity to be, quote, strengthened with all power. And that's referring to God's power. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, the language of the Bible is to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has strengthened me. So there you have it. This is a theme woven through the Bible. The power of God doesn't just reside in heaven. God wants to pour out his power upon godly men and women to equip them for the work of the ministry. So there's no dispute. There should be no dispute in our mind that God does use and God does empower flesh and blood, human beings to accomplish his purposes, but only those of true faith who want to glorify him with their lives. That's the qualifier. Here's an example. In Acts chapter 19, verse 11, and God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Notice that the source of the power behind the miracles is not the man, but the God of the godly man. God is the one who is doing, notice it says God was doing extraordinary miracles miracles, and he uses as his agent, the apostle Paul. Paul doesn't get the credit for it. God gets the credit for it. When we are strengthened for effective godly ministry, bona fide ministry, not fakery, not charlatanism, but when we are empowered for genuine ministry, none of us get to take the credit for it, not in this life and not in the next. It comes to us from the mighty hand of God and look at the amazing way that God used Paul in this instance so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and evil spirits came out of them. So we have exorcisms of demons. We have physical healings taking place. Where does the power come from? The power comes not from the man, but it comes from the God of the godly man. God overcomes and he, equip, he equips and he empowers the apostle here to perform some wonderful things. If you read through the Bible, there's many different miracle accounts. Remember the Red Sea? 
God parts the Red Sea so the Israelites could escape from the hand of the Egyptians. He could have just killed the Egyptians. But he left some of them alive for a period of time, part of the sea, and ultimately many of them were wiped out in the waters and God's people were saved. You might recall passages like Daniel in the lion's den. That's another example where God does an amazing miracle. But one of the most personal miracles that a person can experience is a divine healing. And here God uses Paul, as he has done many other times and many other apostles, to bring physical healing into someone's life. And miracles are extra special, I would say, because they are very personal. They display God's love and God's care for us in a way that no physician, as much as we appreciate physicians, can take credit for. They're very personal. They're a personalized, very beautiful miracle that reminds us of God's blessings and God's care and concern for our individual bodies. And we should rejoice at what God did through Paul and what God has done at various junctures throughout history in healing and performing miracles that bring him honor and glory. Now, in the modern church, it's been my observation, and I believe all of you will share this, that most conversations about miracles are limited to the question, does God still perform miracles? This seems to be the question that many in the Christian church today are fixated upon. Does God still perform miracles? And some who would call themselves cessationists would say, no, they have ceased. Cessationists cease. Others would say, no, we're continuationists. They they continue. And so we have those that would be cessationists, those that would be continuationists. I think both continuationists and cessationists would come together and agree that God has the capacity. Of course, God has the capacity to perform miracles as he sees fit. But there's, there's a lot of very opinionated people that have very strong feelings in answer to this question. God, does God continue to perform miracles today? And as I have observed and read on and reflected upon these discussions, I have noticed that very rarely are the answers that people arrive at exegetical in nature. Meaning they, they're not, they don't necessarily flow from the raw pages of the word of God, but they, they tend more often than not, to be based upon one's experiences. People say, well, I I don't believe that there's miracles today because of guys like Peter Popoff, because of faith healers that have, have been outed as fakes and frauds. And others would say, well, I believe in them because I witnessed them. And you'll notice that the, the exegesis then that people are often doing with regard to the question, does God perform miracles, is based upon their experiences, good experiences or bad experiences. I've seen it, it's been good, or I've seen it and it's been bad. Well, if we were to step back from our experiences for a moment and look not just at the book of Acts, but we look at the whole of the word of God, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, through the period of the judges, through the period of the kings, through the period of the the divided uh, monarchy, through the period of the exiles. Look at the ministry of Christ. Look at the ministry of of the apostles. And we, we look at the whole of scripture. What we see is God doing miracles, but they ebb and they flow. There's an ebb and there's a flow to them. So there's certain times in the word of God when miracles appear to be quite frequent. So we've referenced the Exodus. And there's a whole cluster of miracles surrounding the Exodus. The parting of the Red Sea, the, the staff being turned into a snake, manna from heaven, all sorts of miracles that God is performing during, during that 40-year period of, of the Exodus. We could fast forward through many other miracle episodes in the Bible to the time of Daniel. When the young men are rescued from the fiery furnace, Daniel is rescued from the lion's den. Say so those are miracles that God performed. We read through the Gospels. We see Jesus uh, performing miracles. We were, we've been studying the book of Acts. Now, if, if for some reason you were an extremely fast reader and you were able to read through the entire Bible in a day, you might conclude, man, there's so many miracles recorded in the word of God that we should expect a miracle every single day. I mean, I've just read 
dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of miracles in the word of God. But what we need to understand is the word of God is written and records history over thousands of years. And there are without question key junctures throughout history where God is performing miracles, but there's extended periods of time when there's no record of God performing miracles. Now, the Bible says neither that we should expect a miracle daily, nor does it say that miracles have ceased. It doesn't say either of those things. But rather, it presents us with a a biblical record within which a sovereign God performs miracles, sometimes multiple miracles in a short period of time. And at other junctures, there's periods of time when there's not a whole lot of miracles that are taking place. And so... And so, if I might be so bold as to say this, I am neither a cessationist or a continualist. And the reason why I am neither of these things is because as I read the word of God, what I see is there being periods of time when God does perform miracles, and there's periods of time when God doesn't perform miracles. So it seemed them contrary to the pattern and meta-narrative of the scripture to either expect miracles daily and equally inconsistent with the word of God to deny miracles today. The temptation, of course, again, is to point back to our lived experiences. Well, I saw someone abuse it, or I just don't, I've never seen them legitimately. But perhaps instead of calling ourselves cessationists or continualists, it would be better to call ourselves if God wills it ists. If God wills it ists. And there may be extended periods of time when God is not performing miracles. And then there may be periods of time when God is performing miracles. And you can debate with me about this after, but I would dare you to find either in the word of God, any text that says you should expect miracles every day or to find a verse in the Bible that says there's no more miracles that God is going to do. Rather, we trust in the sovereignty of God. God is going to do miracles when he sees fit. And there's going to be periods of time when he's not going to do miracles. And you should be just as okay with that as when he is performing miracles. Now, apart from the question of frequency, and even more important than the question of frequency is the question of the purpose of miracles. Well, what miracle stories always are intended to do, you might think, is to save people, is to give people wow moments, is to galvanize faith. Well, it often does that. But the primary purpose of miracles is actually to put the power of God on display so that God might be glorified among his people. And so the unbelievers might realize that there is a God to whom they are accountable. So in this context, Paul's miracles remind us of God's power. I'm going to prove this point from the word of God. Proves, prove and remind us of God's power on display in man, but it also serves to remind us of the power of God that men sometimes want that God doesn't necessarily want to make available to them. So here's another way of putting it. Sometimes there are people that want to harness God's power, want to access God's power, want to tap into God's power, whatever that looks like, miracles, ministry gifts, fruitfulness, positions, not for God, because they want to build their churches. Or they want to feel better about themselves. Or they want the applause of men. Or they want to earn some more of this, some more money from their ministry. So they're they're calling upon God. It seems righteous at the outset. I want miracles every day because it brings in the people. It brings in the money. It brings me fame. I sell more books. More people listen to me. There are those that would seek to harness the power of God for their own benefit, not for the glory of God. They may go to great lengths to make it look like it's for God's glory, even using spiritual language. But really, it's for them. 
It's to pad their own pockets, to pad their own ego. Well, the fact of the matter is that eventually it will backfire because while God does, while we do affirm the power of God in man, we disaffirm the power of God in man for personal gain. We disaffirm the power of God in man for personal gain. And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, the Bible tells us, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits saying, I adjure you by the power of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, who were these men that were calling upon the name to cast out demons? We're told seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. In other words, people from a religious family, people who in the eyes of the world were believers, were God-fearing Jews living in a pagan culture. The sons of the high priest listen to how the evil spirit answers. But the evil spirit answered them, well, Jesus, I know. And Paul, I recognize, but who are you? Isn't that interesting? Now, to be sure, we all have, as we live humble lives before God, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we all have a daily measure of God's power to serve in various areas of ministry to encourage, to counsel, to preach, to serve, to administrate the affairs of the church. We all have a measure of God's power, but this is power of a different kind. This is the power to change the laws that govern God's creation. Let's talk about the word miracle for a moment. Sometimes it's stretched and abused or flattened out, so it means almost nothing. So we all believe that God, the world was created by a direct act of God, right? So God spoke the world into existence, ex nihilo, out of nothing, by the power of his word. He spoke the sun into existence, the moon, the dry land, the sea, the fish, the birds, and mankind formed with his own hand. So in that respect, everything in creation is awesome. It's like, wow. When babies are conceived and gestate and are born, it's like, wow, this is an incredible thing. When you plant a seed in the ground and suddenly you got this giant tree that comes up over several, it's an amazing thing. When you look at the cycles of nature, the oceans, ecosystems, the structure of a cell, it's an amazing thing. But all of these things are in keeping with God's design, with the the order, the laws that he has put in place to govern creation. In that respect, it's, they're not miracles. They're awesome, but they're not miracles. Miracles are those things that deny or contravene by God's sovereign work, his own laws. For example, the birth of of a baby, as awesome as it is, isn't a miracle, but a virgin birth is. Waves on the top of an ocean crashing onto the shore are awesome to see, but the parting of the Red Sea, that's a miracle. So miracles are acts of God whereby he overturns the normative laws of physics, biology, chemistry, these sorts of things, which he has put in place to govern creation. These are miracles. And when people are touched by a handkerchief and healed, or demons are exercised from someone, these are miracles. These aren't normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill Incidents. So the miracle stories are intended to put God's power on display, but in their arrogance and desire for attention, the sons of Sceva ask for and assume, assume, keyword, assume that they can just harness the power of God by invoking the name of Jesus and performing miracles. Well, they're about to learn a very difficult but necessary lesson that unless divine power is in fact given to you by God, you do not have access to these miraculous powers. These men are wowed by Paul's abilities. They notice that there's a lot of people showing up at the services. So these Jewish magicians assume it for themselves 
And after all, why, what's wrong with this? I mean, they're, they're using Jesus' name. In fact, they probably put even a little bit of an emphasis on it to make it sound a little more spiritual. Jesus! Because after all, if you pronounce it differently, it must work better, right? And you might think, well, they're doing spiritual things. Why, why would God pick on them? I mean, they're, they're trying to exercise demons. That's a good thing. They're, they're recognizing the authority of Paul. What's wrong with that? They're recognizing the authority of Jesus. Well, the problem with it is not in their actions, but in their intentions. And that it's not for God, it's for self. So we're not pragmatists in that we are able to justify the outcomes without regard for our intentions. Our intentions also must be accurate. And if we are seeking to do the work of God for anything other than the glory of God, expect it to fail. Expect it to fail. You might impress people for a period of time, but ultimately expect it to fail. You see, God will judge those who steal his glory. The word of God goes on to say, and the man, notice singular, not the men, it wasn't a whole group of them, it was one singular individual. In whom was the evil spirit leapt, leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. So it's seven to one. The seven presumably weren't 80 and 90 year old men in wheelchairs because their father was still alive. So presumably they were younger or middle-aged men and there were seven of them. And they encounter one singular individual that's indwelt with a demon and he beats them all up and shreds their clothing from their bodies and they leave humiliated and naked, bloodied and embarrassed. Now, in the midst of this miracle narrative about Paul performing all these wonderful things by the power of God, what do we receive here? We receive a warning, and you better listen to it. We receive a warning that it's sinful to assume divine power for ourselves unless it is granted to us by God. Unless it is granted to us by God. And that starts, of course, with true belief in Christ, which these men likely did not possess. The demons interestingly acknowledge the legitimate authority of the apostle and the legitimate authority of Christ. But at the same time, they beat the tar out of these seven charlatans. Now, I think there's also a bit of a reminder here that demons are powerful and dangerous beings and are not to be trifled with. This doesn't mean that we live in fear of the demonic realm. There's, there's not even a smidgen of room in our lives as Christians to live in fear of the demonic realm. You don't need to be afraid of demons. But you don't enter into demonic exorcisms or spiritual battle of this sort without due consideration for the will of God in the matter, the power of God in the matter, humility, Questioning your intentions, questioning your motives. See, brothers and sisters, Jesus' name isn't a formula. It's not a formula. I'm, I've always been disturbed by this, that there's some even in the church that treat Jesus' name as if it's a formula on par with abracadabra, rabbits coming out of the hat. People that think, well, if I just articulate Jesus, that the demons are going to flee from me. Now, this actually is from paganism. The pagans were the ones that thought they could manipulate reality through, through incantations. If they just say certain words or hum certain phrases or sing certain songs or chant certain chants, they could manipulate reality. There's many Christians that have borrowed that false theology and applied it to the faith. They think that, faith, they think that if they say the word Jesus, the demons have to flee. But actually... What does the name represent? The power of the one who bears it. 
the savior of the world. And if you don't have his power, you're dead in the water. You're dead in the water. So when we get into spiritual warfare, we have to be, we have to do a lot of soul searching. We have to do a lot of soul searching to make sure that we're not relying upon our own power or some sort of magical incantations, but that the God of the universe actually shows up to do the miracle that we're calling upon him to do, be it a demonic possession or whatever it might be. Now, as interesting as this narrative is about guys getting beat up by demons, the passage isn't ultimately about a guy getting beat up by demons. The true purpose of miracles, as I've stated repeatedly, is the glory of God. And what's interesting in the word of God is there's oftentimes something good that happens and then something bad that happens. You're like, why did God allow something bad to happen? Well, ultimately God works out his purpose so that something good might happen again. And that which is good ultimately is his glory. So this is the fourth point. God will get the glory he is due. One way or another, God will get the glory he is due. So if you're stealing glory from God, he'll get glory for himself one way or another. So after these charlatans, are rebuked and embarrassed, the Bible says, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled, meaning lifted high. God was glorified. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. Which reminds us that just because you're a believer doesn't mean you've necessarily yet been fully sanctified. You haven't necessarily yet confessed and divulged all of your former practices. But when they see the power of God truly on display, they're like, we better get our acts together. We better confess our sin and turn from our wicked practices. You see, the glory of God pushes us towards repentance. And then even in repentance, God is further glorified. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts, the Bible says, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. You're like, ah, it's just old books. Who cares? Well, keep in mind, this is at a day and age where books are written by hand and are incredibly expensive. So just for context, if you're in the first century and you wanted to purchase a slave, the price of a slave really hadn't changed for about 500 years. It was about 30 pieces of silver. So 30 pieces of silver is what you'd, you'd pay for a slave. This is the equivalent of what Jesus was betrayed for. This is the equivalent of what Hosea paid and bartered for in order to get his wife back from the slave market. So about 30 pieces of silver, quite a bit of money. They burned their books and they were told how much those books are worth. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. So all this nonsense with the sons of Sceva and some people we'll meet later on in the same chapter, ultimately God turns that which was intended for evil on its head and he is glorified and the people of God come out in en masse and they're burning all their old worldviews all their old ways, all their ways of thinking about the world in the public square. Brothers and sisters, it's a great reminder that repentance is expressed by the wholesale abandonment of our old worldviews, of our old relationships, of our old ways. It's not enough to just say, Jesus, save me. Okay, I'm born again. Now I can do whatever I want. God wants your wholesale surrender. Now you may have been walking with Christ for a long time, maybe even decades, and you still have some of your old, quote unquote, books in your library, your old ways of thinking, you're maintaining your old relationships. It's time to burn them, brothers and sisters. You might remember that when Hernan Cortez landed his ships on what is now Mexico in 1519, he said to his men, let's burn the ships. And the reason why he wanted the ships to be burned is because he wanted to ensure that these men that were setting foot on new territory would stay committed to their mission. That when it got tough, they wouldn't say, well, it's it's too difficult following the mission that the king has sent us on. So we're just going to get back in our boats and head back across the 
the, the Atlantic. So now we're going to burn the ships because we are going to stay committed to our mission. In the same way, we need to burn our ships, our old lifestyles, our old ways of thinking. It's kind of like if you're in a relationship. You're in a romantic relationship. You're writing love letters. The relationship ends. Time goes by. You find the love of your life. You get married. Do you keep your old love letters? You burn the old love letters. You put that which was before, uh, before you behind you. You walk forward in this new relationship with your new husband or wife. How many of us, as we assess our own lives, would be able to sh- say, we have burned our books, we've burned our ships, we've burned the old love letters. We don't have them anymore. On the other hand, how many might have to admit, you know what, yeah, I, I do kind of maintain some of those old habits. I do maintain some of the old language. I do maintain some of those old relationships. I do maintain some of those old ways of thinking. Well, if you, if you do that, if you make those mistakes, it's because you're not living in the fear of the power of God. And you're really not all that committed to the glory of God shining through you. So may we each be encouraged and convicted and challenged to burn the ships, to burn our books, to put behind us the old ways of life, the old ways of thinking, and to live our lives in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ that he might receive the honor and the glory. Now, here's a little footnote to encourage you before we land the plane. The mission of God is the glory of God, but guess what? We also benefit when we put his mission first. So the footnote is we also benefit when we live our lives for his glory because it's, it's in living in a properly ordered world where God is superior and we realize we are creatures, where we are for his honor and glory, where we are his servants, that we have peace, that we have contentment, that we have joy, that we have provision. So while we live our lives ultimately for the glory of God, God also blesses those that bring him glory and